Hello and welcome to this tutorial where I hope to go over some of the best practices for processing files with Integration Host. So to start with, I'm going to change the receiving activity type to be a directory scanner. And it's going to be prompting me for a name. I'm not going to use a name. There's a good reason for that. If I type in the directory, you'll notice that the name is automatically picked up and created using the directory that I've typed in. So this can be helpful when I'm viewing the workflow, I can automatically see what this activity is doing, where it's getting the files. However, for some people, it might be more practical to actually give it a proper name. The next is the filter. So this is the type of file that we're gonna pick up. I'm gonna have this pick up from the C temp directory every HR7 file, so that suits. But if I was using you know, XML or something, it's just a matter of changing that file name to XML. It does support multiple file types, but that's mostly not practical for our purposes. So I'm just gonna change that back to HR7. So we'll pick up all HR7 files from the temp directory. And so we've got the choice of, are we going to keep waiting for more files to be constantly added to that directory and processing them as they come? Or do we prefer once all the files have been processed that we should stop processing? It will no longer wait for more files to be added and we'll just stop the process. And that will allow you to perhaps build up files and then start the workflow again at whatever time suits you. But I would generally prefer to just keep processing in real time so that's what I'll do I'll leave it on the keep waiting for more files to be added I'll set the message type so again I'm bringing in an HR7 message so the message type would obviously be HR7 but you would change that appropriately and I'm going to put in a sample message for the HR7 this is just to give the system something that I can use for bindings and stuff it's a sample file that provides me the structure of the message it's not actually the message being processed but it does make it much simpler to create my workflow. And then there's a post-processing section. Do we want to delete this file after we've finished processing? You would probably do that if you have another system that's sending in the files to this, but it's also storing a, re a replication of that file. Right? It has logs that you can go back to and resend from the other system. Also, it could just be a low priority file. It doesn't really matter if this gets through or not. But if it is a high priority file and you can't replicate it from the other system, then obviously you're not gonna to want to delete it. You'll probably instead want to move it to another directory after processing. So I can click that and I can put in a path for it to, to go to. So call it CT back. And then after it's finished processing, it's going to put that file into this directory. I think it makes good sense. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out is you can actually read in the data from that file. It has been processed at this time that it's writing it into a backup. So that means you can, of course, group them together in a particular directory. So I'm going to I'm say take all the patients ID number and I'm just going to drag that in. So now it's going to create a directory. Put another backslash. It's going to create a directory that uses part of the data from the message in the directory name. That can help sorting up your backed up data for you. And then also we've got the error action. The directory scanner is a little bit different to the other activity types. The other ones tend to have one system pumping data into your workflow. If something goes wrong, it's really for the other system to send you that data again. The file system, that's just not possible, right? If an error happens, how do you tell the file system to reprocess that message? So you can't. So what we've got for directory scanners is an error action. By default, it will stop the workflow and allow you to come and look at it. Probably not great for production, but great for testing, right? So you can see it stop and you can go back and have a look at what happened. It can retry until it's successful. Now that's really good for... Uh, perhaps there's a connection uh, across a network, the network goes down, you're going to want it to retry until it can get that message through, particularly in mission critical systems. Do be aware though, it is going to retry, so it's going to be processing over and over again if an error goes wrong. So if that's the type of error that cannot be resolved, so maybe it's writing to an invalid file name for instance, no matter how many times it retries, it's going to still get the same error. So often you would only put it onto retry until fail on a live production system where you've thoroughly tested your workflow, you've made sure it's going to work correctly in all scenarios. You can still, however, whilst it is retrying, you could still go into integration host and just stop the workflow if things are going wrong. So it's worth keeping that in mind. Move the file to a directory. That's that's a great one. Sometimes data could be funny, right? So you have a directory that you can have a, as a sort of a retry directory. So that allows you to say, if this file falters, we're going to shift this file into this other directory. And then you can monitor that directory yourself 
maybe even with a different process, and, and re-handle it, you know, maybe send off an email to you if things happening wrong or something like that. That's up to you. But what it does allow is for the rest of the messages to continue being processed, right? You, if you've got a system where one bad message stops the whole thing processing, but all those other messages should really be processed, you're gonna to wanna to turn this into a move file to directory, okay? So it takes the error problem, puts it aside, and then allows everything else to keep going. Finally, there is delete file. Makes sense for some systems, perhaps temporary stuff that is not critical at all. Once the file errors, it just shifts it out the way it deletes it, and it's just gonna then continue processing the rest of the files. So I'm gonna set it to move to a, a, a directory, and then I can place in another one. So I'll just put in this temp error. Okay, so that is your directory scanner. Let's have a look at what happens when we now write out that file again. I'm going to add another activity and I'm going to set this to a file writer. Again, same thing applies. If I don't give it a name, it will use in, out the path that I type in to generate the name. And in this case, we're not providing it with a directory. We are actually providing it with a full file name. So I'm going to just call it file.csv. Okay, so that's great. So it's going to write out the, and it's going to call it file.csv. Now there's a bit of a problem with that, right? Which means that it's always going to be called file.csv. So let me discuss a few of the ways around fixing this problem so you're not always writing the same file name every time. We are writing is a CSV, so I'm just going to change it across to CSV. And CSVs support multiple records per file, right? So in this case, the max records per file is set to 5,000. It's going to write 5,000 lines of data into that record before it then tries to, to move on. And it's gonna do that after the 5,000, it would then move the file to another directory. If you don't move it to another directory and you've set it to the, a fixed file name like this, it's gonna end up just overwriting itself every 5,000 records, okay? So you don't wanna configure it that way. You wanna make sure that you move it to another directory after processing. I'll call this one C temp. There's my directory that I'm going to be writing it to. And the great thing about that is when it does write the file, when it moves, sorry, when it does move the file to the processing directory, it's going to automatically make sure that the file name is unique. So it didn't matter that I've given it a fixed file name. You could always consider this to be a temporary file. And then when it moves it into the C temp, it's going to append some characters on at the end and it will guarantee that that file name is unique, but it will change it, right? However, there was another way that I could have actually made it so that the file name was always created uniquely. And that is, I could actually use a value from the workflow. So the first thing would be perhaps I could use uh, the, the time, right? So let, let's have a look at that. So I could change the file name. I right click in the right place, say insert variable, and then I could say the current date time. Okay, so that's now going to put the current date time into the file. It's going to write it as ctemp file, and then it'll be, you know, the HR7 format, year, month, day, uh, down to the second.csv. So that's great. Now I've got a unique file name, but it's, of course, that's only valid every second. If you write multiple files per second, then it's going to no longer be unique. So I don't recommend using the current date time. Instead, what I'd like you to use if you want to make it unique is insert variable, uh, use the workflow instance ID. Now the workflow instance ID, it's just an ID that increments with each iteration of your workflow. And so that will guarantee that you'll have a unique file name. You're not stuck with just those values. You are welcome to also take values out of your incoming message. So I can go down to the patient name and grab in maybe the family name for instance, I'll just drop that in there. And so now it will also have the family name appended. Uh, that could be helpful if you're wanting to make the files just more identifiable. Now incidentally, now that we've got it like that, now when it moves it to the output directory, it's already gonna be unique. So you're not gonna end up with a newly generated file name unless there was some conflict of a previously run system. All right, so now all that makes good sense for CSV. If it was actually an XML file, uh, JSON files, you really aren't going to be wanting to write multiple records per file. It actually tends to make sense to just write it as one record per file. And then that way you'll end up with a newly generated file each time. So that applies mostly to XML and JSON. Uh, HL7, kind of up to you. Sometimes people prefer them as single records per file. And sometimes they prefer to have maybe a day's list of files. And, and it's all just supported. So the HL7 format 
kind of handles either one, it doesn't really matter. Okay, but CSV, definitely want a big number in there. Uh, one more thing I wanted to point out with the moving the file to another directory after processing. I think this is a really good practice if you've got another system that's going to pick up and process your file afterwards. And the reason is so you can create your file in a temp directory. It can be built up and then only once it's actually completed is it then moved into another directory. And then the other system can then process it in its completed state. If you don't use that mechanism, particularly when you're writing out, say, 5,000 records into the file, it can actually take a long time for that file to be built up. And you don't want your other system to detect that file, grab it, and then start processing it too early, right? You're going to end up losing records. So always make sure, if you are processing it by another system, to set this to make it move into another directory when you finish processing, okay? If you're just archiving the data, it doesn't matter. You don't need to do it that way. You could actually write it straight into the correct directory. Okay, so now we're going to build up our data that we're writing out. By default, it was bound, of course, to the incoming message because we are changing the types. I will delete that. And now I just need to build up my CSV. So I can provide it with the headers for it, or I can just actually drag in the fields I want. So I prefer to drag in the fields. So I just drag in the patient ID, and the family name, the given name. Notice it's, it's actually just putting in the commas for me makes my life a bit easier. Oops, didn't want to try that. Okay, so now we've got a very simple CSV and I probably want to give it some headers too. So I've got an ID, comma, first name, oh no, last name. First name, and I'm just typing these out the way I'd like it to appear in the file. So the header line, it's literally just a comma separated list of header names. I'm just going to head back up to the top now. You'll notice that it's you got because it's got the variables in it. The name's actually looking pretty ugly now. So I might really just want to change that to uh, write to C temp out, and that just gives it a better indication of what this activity is doing. The variable names obviously I think they can't be replaced into the the name of the activity. So in that case, it's probably just better to type them in. Hopefully this has gone some way to help you using HL7Soup's integration hosts to read in files, to process them, to convert them out, and shows you some of the pitfalls that you can encounter when dealing with files. Making sure that you're not overwriting the name of it, making sure that you give it a unique file name, make sure that the other processing systems don't interfere. As per usual, if we've helped you, please give us a like, uh, maybe even consider subscribing. Um, I'd love to hear your comments, any thoughts of what you'd like for us from the future.